Our session, the power of digital innovation hubs to accelerate the digitalization of en Europe's energy transition. Mm -hmm. I'll be your host and moderator, Andreas Corusa. Maybe two cents from my side. Um, I'm my background is from uh, energy uh, engineering in general, and after being in Asia for a few years in the entrepreneurship, um, I'm for the last few years working. Um, in bigger energy projects, and now at Baum also in energy programs. And I'll be your host and moderator today. Um, let's see if this works. Very good. And our agenda for today. So uh, we are a little bit late, sorry for that. We had to wait for another session so that people can in fact join. Um, we'll hear a keynote speech from from two colleagues here from, uh, from, the, from the commission. And after that, we'll have a panel discussion with a few various speakers from the field. Um, we will have a Q&A session after that, um, depending on how much time we have. And we will have a wrap up and a closing in the end. So just a few remarks um, to the session itself. Mm you have the possibility to post your picture uh, uh, questions and the Q&A uh, at any point in time. We will gather this information and then we will try to implement that in our Q&A session after all the inputs that we got from our speakers. Um, you have a follow-up link in the chat, please use that. And we'll have uh, a seven, I think seven poll questions ongoing, so please also for the people on site here, scan the QR code and feel free to join our polls. And here's the first one as a, I would say, warm up so you can be familiar with the system if you haven't done it already yet. Um, the question is, which stakeholder group do you belong to? Is it maybe a company, a decision maker, academia or others? So feel free now, if you can, use your phone or online. Is it not started yet? Yes. I cannot see it. Ah, there. Okay. Okay, now you have the possibility to scan the QR codes. And for the ones digitally attending, you might have the link. Maybe it's a little bit easier for you. So feel free to tell us where you're from so we also get to know you a little bit better. And maybe we can also address the questions that you then have a little bit better too. So we have some time. And there's also warm up because we have a few of them coming up. Therefore, get familiar with the system. Maybe one more minute. Maybe we can reach 20 at least. Yes, two more. All right, let's close the poll for now so we can continue. So our first keynote speech will be held by Julia Serra and Eve Pendevain. I hope I pronounced it correctly. I'll do my best. Um, I'll give you short information about the two of them and then they will, then they will um, have their keynote speech. Thank you. 
So Julia Serra has a master's in management of international business with a specialization on renewable energy market. And she joined the European Commission in 2019 already. And she's a policy officer at DG Energy at the Research, Innovation, and Digitalization Competitiveness Unit. And she's especially responsible for preparation of the annual progress reports on competitiveness of clean energy technologies, which assesses the competitiveness of the EU industry in the global market. She's working a team um, at the Digitalization of Energy Action Plan, and she promotes investments through a structural and coordinated approach between energy and digital players. Her hobby, I was told, uh, is African dance. So maybe that's a remark you can talk uh, with her about after the session, just, just an insight. And uh, Eve, uh, on the left to me, um, has two degrees, one in computing science engineering and one in electronics engineering. According to LinkedIn, because I didn't receive a short description of your CV, dear Eve, um, he is 24 years at the European Union or European Commission, and uh, she was firstly working as a scientific officer and later then uh, as an assistant of the Director of Strategy and Policy Coordination and then for DG Connect as, as well. And now he's the head of sector digitizing Europe industry governance at DG Connect. And his hobby, of course, we will continue with that, is um, installing smart home applications at home. Very interesting. The floor is yours, so is the pointer. Sound check. It works, right? Okay. So, and the slides are. How, okay. How do I? I just go next. Okay. So here. Uh, so, indeed, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be here, but also to to share the floor with Gibbs. Digitalization of energy. Um, I don't know how many of you actually joined the opening speech from our director just uh, half an hour ago. Um, she highlighted several points and key elements on why digitalization of energy is important, why now, what is the rationale behind it, and what needs to be done. Digitalization of energy is about the twin green and digital transition. At the same time, the EU requires uh, an energy system that is much more smarter, integrated and interoperable if we want to meet our Green Deal objectives. And of course, digital solution, digital technologies, innovative solution can really help in this direction because indeed they can help us in shaping the energy system that we need. They can, of course, change and improve the way we manage the energy system. And they can, of course, also ensure that all the actors across the energy value chain and across the digital value chain are properly involved to go through this transition and to achieve the twin green and digital transition. So digital technologies is not only about the energy system per se, it's also about changing the society, it's also about changing the way we look at the energy system. When we talk about digitalization of energy and how to integrate digital solution in the energy system, of course, first we look at the opportunities, at the new services, at the new business models that can emerge, at different actors that can be involved, at innovative solutions that we can develop. But of course, we also need to look at the challenges that integrated digital solution will, will bring with it. And this is a bit the rationale behind our work on digitalization of energy that we've started not only within DG Energy, but within the Commission and also in close collaboration with our colleagues in DG Connect. Here on the slide, I try to summarize which are the steps that led to the preparation of our digitalization of energy action plan. The digitalization of energy action plan will be released in the coming days and aims at proposing concrete steps towards the achievement of the twin green and digital transition to support the transition, but also to support the achievement of the Green Deal objective and to contribute to the key challenges that we are currently facing. 
the digitalization of energy action plan as such will propose a vision. And once again, when we speak about digitalization, we can speak about different areas from different angles, different actors to be involved at different level. This on the screen is, is a summary of the focus area of our digitalization of energy action plan. Once again, opportunities and challenges. When we speak about digitalization of energy, of course, we cannot leave out data, data access and data exchange. They are, of course, a prerequisite if we want to make our energy system more integrated, interoperable, interactive. If we want new business model to emerge and to end up in the market, if we want new solutions to be uptake and to be integrated, but also if we want to strengthen interoperability across different sectors. And if we want to allow all the sectors to, um, to relate to each other and to, yeah, to communicate and to have a, com a proper exchange on the kind of data that we need. But of course, this cannot happen without investment. And this cannot happen without investment that are targeted. If we do not create a pathway, if we do not identify what are the needs, what kind of investments are needed for this energy system for a digitalized one. And of course, we also need a clear pathway for investment because this translates into stimulating private investors to participate even more. And when we speak about investment, we speak about investment in research and innovation for new innovative solutions, but we also touch development, deployment, the market uptake of solutions. And of course, it belongs to different areas. When we speak about investment, we speak about the energy system. Of course, we speak about the smartness of the electricity grids that are the backbone of our energy system. And then there is another area without which, of course, digitalization of energy system cannot really happen, and this the empowerment of consumers. On one side, of course, we need to build consensus, we need to build trust, we need to increase awareness, we need to make them aware of the added value of integrated digital solution in the energy system, and at the same time, we need to empower them. They need to be part of the transition, they need to be part of it, so we need to make available for them digital service that can allow them to participate more actively in the energy system. And of course, we need to take into account that digital solution cannot be a factor of discrimination. We need to have a transition that is fair, that leaves no one behind. And you know, this, of course, needs to be taken into account. And I said at the beginning, opportunities cannot be exploited without addressing challenges. And these are the other two areas that you see on the screen cybersecurity and the growing energy consumption of the ICT sector. These are the challenges that the action plan will look at, will further investigate, because indeed digitalization cannot fully unlocked, digital solution cannot be fully unlocked if we do not look at the challenges. And together with these areas, we have of course plenty of other considerations to be made to make it happen, to make it more concrete. And this is what we are also gonna discuss here today. There is a, an overarching dimension or what we like to call this more holistic approach that we need to take when it's about um, thinking about concrete solution. And it's about this need of structural dialogue, a continuous one across different actors, across different areas, across different sectors, at different levels. And this is another relevant part that we're gonna explore even more in the digitalization of energy action plan. As I mentioned at the beginning, digitalization is not only about the energy system transition, it's also about changing, impacting the society where we live, in which we live. And we need to understand what are the needs, what are among these needs the priorities to be tackled first, what are the mutual interests, not only across you, across member states, but also uh, across local innovation ecosystem and 
other innovation ecosystem at different level, in the energy domain, in the digital domain? What are the challenges to address? When we started to, to work on the digitalization of energy action plan, we were indeed asking ourselves these questions and we were also trying to understand, okay, first of all, we need to get together, to gather together the energy and digital agenda. Then we need to gather together different actors, um, stakeholders, but also public authorities, but also initiatives, tools and platforms that are already active in the energy and digital domain. We need to understand and we need to listen to the local innovation ecosystem to understand what's already going on, what are the best practices, um, what are the difficulties, but also to what extent and how local solution can indeed be scaled up to become European solution. And then, of course, we ask ourselves the question, why a European-wide approach would be needed? What would be the added value to avoid duplication with all the other initiatives and tools already in place? Um, what could be done? And here on the screen, you see some of the main priorities that we identify when back in February 2022, we organized indeed a workshop dedicated to this dialogue with all these actors involved. And it emerged that indeed we need a common agenda to work on and within this common agenda, we need priorities to start from. We also need to build these knowledge communities. We need communities to share best practices, but also to better understand difficulties and challenges and to what extent a European approach can address tackling challenges that addressing challenges that sometimes belong to local innovation ecosystem, but indeed there are opportunities and challenges that can be in common and we can all learn from different realities. And it was also very interesting to, to see that one of the main priorities is this need to build a common language between the energy and the digital domain. We now talk about this twin transition, but it's true we need to, need, we need to build uh, a common field of understanding, a common starting point, a dialogue to build. And we need to do it building a common language, but also to be sure that the energy and the digital agenda go hands on hand, but also the players can interact the way we would need them to interact. And this is also why it's very important, the work that we have been doing with our colleagues in DigiConnect. Of course, when we start working on, on the action plan, the European Digital Innovation Hubs were on top of our list to better understand what's going on, what kind of network, who to target, who to involve, what are the sector, what we're going to achieve. So we're very happy of the collaboration that we, are, we have been having. And I leave the floor to, to Yves to, to tell you more about the apps. Thank you. Many thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and uh, thank you for this, this opportunity to give you a bit of uh, an infrastructure that we are deploying. Um, maybe I will start with an example that will show my age, probably. If you remember the oil crisis that we have had in the 70s, where uh, suddenly we had even no car in the street. If you think of how much uh, liter you had to put of gas that you had to put in your car at the time, and if you think of how much of the same uh, gas you put in your car today, you see that there has been a huge uh, leap in terms of innovation and in terms of efficiency. That is, we are able to do much more with the same liter of gas that what we used to do before. So that's just to give an example of the type of boost of innovation that has happened in 50 years. Now we want to repeat the same thing. We want to repeat the same thing in less time, and we want to repeat the same thing thanks to digital technologies. And uh, typically here, we will not only use digital technologies to improve the energy systems, so how we can have a much more efficient grid but also on how companies, SMEs, can do more with every unit of energy that they consume, either by being more efficient in their process or in their logistics, or by saving uh, energy. And we are actually deploying such an infrastructure now. Now, if 
I, talking of an infrastructure, and uh, I think we don't have the presentation anymore. Um, if we are talking of an infrastructure, we are talking here of the digital innovation hubs. Now, you might say, okay, what is this new animal uh, that the Commission has uh, invented? Uh, and actually, this comes from a, an observation. An observation that if you are an SME and you have in front of you a vast series of different digital technologies, and you would like to perform a digital transition because you think that intuitively that's, that's the way to go. That's the way to achieve more productivity. Uh, well, good luck, because it's very difficult to know where to start. And it's very difficult to know what is actually helping you or what will just be a vendor solution that will tell you miracles and then in the end, uh, it will not be the, the, the bottom line on your balance sheet that you, would, that you would expect. So we have this model that we have already now experimented for a number of years, which is a digital innovation hub. It's a one-stop shop. It's uh, the part where, uh, as a company, I could go and I could say, look, I have these and these and these processes, uh, or I'm doing these products, or that's my business model. Can you help me to make it more efficient? So that means more efficient in terms of the process, digital in the goods and in the products that are being made, or even changing the business model. This is really a place where you can go, you can touch what is digital technology, what it can help you, and you can experiment with it. You can really test in various settings before making the decision of investing for it. Now, it's a bit more than that, because if it were only this, uh, it would not be a full set of services. We have built it with, with a bit more services in a sense that we have also asked them to look around who could be the supplier of digital innovation and to do this matchmaking, because they are going to serve two clients, two types of clients, those with basic digitalization needs, but as well as those who have already performed a digital transition. And in the growth path, they are willing to get more uh, of digital innovation insight to become more efficient. Uh, plus, once you have made already the first steps, you might want to get access to finance because it's not only that the, the digitalization or the digital transformation is to be financed out of uh, free cash flow. This is a, a part where you might have financial instruments that are interesting to have uh, in order to go and transform and have a business case here of a transformation. And what we have done is we have had a call where we have called for such of a support infrastructure. They were first nominated by the member states because they recognized that these were the organization in each of the country as being the most appropriate to deliver these services. And we have done now a call where we are contracting them and we are financing them half of their operation thanks to the Digital Europe program. So that's a bit the kind of, of thing. Now, this has a very heavy anchor in a given territory, in a region, because there is this need to have this proximity with SMEs. And what we have now also provided is this ability for one hub to call upon the network. Assume, for example, that one digital innovation hub doesn't have all the competences, all the digital competences that are needed. And most often than not, this will be the case. That means that here, a digital innovation hub who doesn't have a competence, let's say, for example, in computer vision, because that's where, they, that's where the company wants to go. It could call upon the network to find another hub in Europe which can actually serve that need. So that's a bit the power here of the network. And we have massively deployed you now this digital innovation hub. Uh, and one hub would be really the entry into, into the network. And if I go and I, I summarize a bit where we, where we are getting to, 
call one, so the first call that we had early this year, we have now 136 hubs that are, that are going to be started. Some of them have started 1st of September, some October, November, but this is now the period where we are actually having all those hubs starting. Uh, it means that they will become operational very soon. 136 hubs with a number of uh, competences in the digital technologies that they serve, in a number of uh, sectors in which they have uh, also specialized. And uh, in two days from now, we are opening another call because we do not have the coverage which is fully complete. So of the 136 hubs that we are now launching, we complete now the coverage. Some countries have not, have not yet a hub, some have incomplete coverage, that's where we want to go. Those will be those that we will finance. In addition to that, uh, what we have done is we are giving also a seal of excellence for those that we are not going to finance. That is, if they can find money from national, regional level or from private sources, they will be entitled with this seal of excellence to participate at the same level as the others. So it means we could have even up to 180 hubs across Europe that can serve the need for the digital transformation of our companies to make better use of, the, uh, uh, of energy in terms of um, their product, their processes, uh, or even changing their, their business model. Now, if I go a bit beyond, and, and I did a bit the exercise of looking into uh, the hubs that could be related uh, that have energy competences. That is, they would be able to develop this specialty that could be needed. They have 37 of those. Remember, that might be a trick question. And uh, those are already spread over Europe. Now, thanks to the network, we achieve here a coverage. Uh, it means that a hub in another country could call upon those hubs to actually get a, a better efficiency or even energy savings in some part thanks to the, the digital technologies. You see, we deploy an infrastructure. Uh, here, two messages. If you are a company who has to offer digital technologies which can help make yourself known from the hubs, uh, and if you are a, a, a company desperately in need also to go through a digital transformation to help to actually master uh, the way you deal with, the, with energy, uh, then that would be a good way is to knock on the door of your local hub in order to, to get help and to, to get support. There will be a few links for those who would want to dig deeper. There will be a catalog um, that, will be, that will become online. So don't hesitate, uh, we are there. This is just the start of a long walk, which we hope will in the end will boost innovation in a way that is fast uh, and in a way that makes Europe a better place. With this, we thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very insightful information about the energy hubs. Um, digital hubs that we will now see and we'll see more of that in the future. Thanks, Julia, and thank you, Yves. Um, now, we would like to start another poll for you, and um, Eve announced it, so there will be another question, and I think it's rather easy to answer. So the question is, how many of the energy-related European digital innovation hubs are there currently? So we have learned that there are many yet to come, but there are some that are already identified as the ones that are energy related. I will not spoil anything, so feel free to, to use the poll. So we have five people attending. Let's see who was listening closely enough. Also, don't get biased by all these answers that you see on the screen. We 
give you a little bit more time. For the ones attending here, find one QR code, if you can, at one of the many screens around you. All right, I think we can close the poll. So yes, you're right, um, it's 37. So most of you definitely did listen to Eve speaking. So um, let's go, so thank you very much again for these insights that we got for the innovation hubs that we yet to come and are already here. Now we'll go into more of a practical approach and listen to some that might be already a hub or will see certain things connected to the hub. And I would like to introduce the next speaker. Um, sorry, I will not introduce the next speaker first. We'll do another poll. Now we're gonna change it a little bit for, your, for those who are here. So now we're gonna do it this way that we will answer, uh, there'll be a question and then um, you can give your thoughts about it. So just read it, it's a little bit longer, but I hope um, you, we can go through it together. So which of the fully energy related services, we heard some of them already addressed by Julia and Eve, by digital innovation hubs should be tackled first. So this is just your opinion on what could be done first, what could be prioritized, maybe it's also insightful for you guys, um, what could be done. And um, I'll leave this open for a while. So feel free to just give more input on what you believe might be the thing to address first when actually dealing with such hub. Um, and take your time. We have definitely allocated some time for your interaction here. And while you're giving answers, I think we could switch to our next speaker, if this is possible, technically. So feel free, just give more answers and we will um, go to the next speaker in our panel. Is it possible? Okay, maybe I can start introducing the next session and while we're figuring out what's going on. So next speaker is joining us digitally. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here physically, but he's joining us digitally. Um, his name is Daniel Stetter from the Fraunhofer Institute for Industrial Engineering, IAO. And uh, he studied physics and uh, economic science. And after that, he did the PhD in energy economy with a focus on renewables at Energy Aerospace Center, DLR. After several stages, a ministerial area and um, mid-sized businesses. Um, he is since 2021, director of Institute and head of research division, smart energy and mobility solutions. And of course, his hobby, I announced it, is playing basketball. I was told he's very tall and I hope we can get him now to present his session. The floor is yours, Daniel. Well, thank you, Andreas. I hope you guys can hear me well. Okay, well, uh, first of all, thank you, Julia, Ethan, Andreas, for having me today. And uh, to all the organizers uh, for, uh, for having me. Um, I was asked to give a quick spotlight on um, an energy innovation hub in practice. So I'd like to uh, present to you um, a charging network that we established at Fraunhofer um, in uh, 2018, a project that started five years ago. Um, just one question, uh, will you uh, uh, guide me through my slides now? So I can just ask you to, um, to put on the next slide. I think we can do that, yes, just a second. Okay. I 
Yeah, I think we are. There we are, I think. We're sorry for the technical hiccups, but we'll figure this out quick, I believe. Here we are, Andreas, perfectly. So you can all see the screen. Okay, perfect. So we established this uh, research network. It's uh, uh, over 50% of all Fraunhofer institutes in Germany um, uh, participate in this uh, research network. It's the largest charging network uh, for research purposes, at least in Germany, um, probably beyond in Europe as well. Uh, and it's the number 11 in terms of charging points uh, in Germany uh, as far as the number of charging points is concerned. We established this network five years ago. We started the project. And as you may be aware, uh, five years ago, uh, a breakthrough of e-mobility at the time had still been disputed. Uh, we're at another um, point in time right now, but uh, at the time it's uh, it's been disputed. Uh, but ever since, uh, as you all know, uh, figures have gone uh, up sharply. So um, we sh we established this charging network. We built up charging infrastructure. Uh, we uh, developed charging algorithms and many more things. Um, but we came up with uh, one fundamental issue that has to be tackled in the future, and that is the next slide. If we really um, want to accommodate uh, renewable energies uh, to a large share, which we have to in order to meet climate goals, um, we need a, a complementary uh, um, resource on the demand side, uh, which uh, can be managed and electric cars as well as heat pumps are a great uh, possibility to do so. Um, so if you go on the next slide, you will also see the uh, demand uh, that will be rising on um, the electricity demand due to uh, the uh, introduction of electric vehicles into the market. And the blue columns uh, indicate the terawatt hours in Germany that will uh, come on top of the some 600 terawatt hours of consumption we have uh, nowadays. Uh, now, uh, we're facing two fundamental issues here. Uh, one is um, a physical issue and the other one is an economic issue. Um, and this you will understand, at least in the spotlight on the next slide, because uh, it's the idea how uh, balancing uh, works. Ooh, this one uh, got messed up, but uh, uh, balancing uh, with system operators uh, works in a way that uh, we use standard load profiles a lot of times, especially for electric cars, uh, we still use it. But this will give us a large discrepancy, as you might see here, between uh, the real world load profile and the standard load profile. So uh, we have to tackle a, a, an issue that uh, can be uh, explained by uh, pure physics, but we also have to tackle an economic issue because uh, these delta sums have to be met by other power plants, uh, whether it's negative or positive frequency control. And this is on the next slide. The more electric cars we introduce into the market, the larger the share of imbalance energy demand needed uh, will become. Uh, this is only the share and the terawatt hours will also go up. So system operators will really face um, a problem uh, because if they want to be smooth sailing also in the future, as far as a system operation is concerned, uh, on the next slide, they will re they will need uh, uh, real time data. Um, they will need information uh, on what's going on in their grids, and uh, they will need they will also need uh, the possibility to manage many small uh, consumers and uh, uh, power plants. Um, 
just to give you an idea, in the so-called old energy world, um, maybe a couple of decades ago, we managed our power system electricity in Germany with some 500 large power plants. And uh, we now have over 2 million photovoltaic uh, power plants. Uh, we have uh, many millions of electric cars and heat pumps, uh, which will come into the market and all of these small entities will have to be managed. So what we uh, suggest and propose, and this is my last slide, um, if you will switch to that, is uh, actually a uh, distributed ledger technology solution that will uh, enable uh, all players in the market that are of concern, system operators, uh, customers, uh, CPOs, charge point operators, and, and many more uh, uh, demand side aggregators uh, to access information in real time and uh, to access information only if you uh, are uh, the right holder uh, of this information. So this is something we're working on with our huge charging network as an innovation hub. Uh, I wanted to give you a quick spotlight on this. Uh, I hope I could give you some ideas uh, also for our discussion. And I'd like to thank you again for having me. Thank you very much, Daniel. So now we could maybe go back to our poll that we had open and close it. So according to you, we should provide access technical expertise, experimentation, improve energy systems, for example, for the local system. This would be the first, um, most of all, focused uh, according to you. Thank you very much for attending. And now we come to the second panelist, Orsolia Kutel. And before we uh, give her the this, uh, the opportunity to talk. There is another small question for you. So, unfortunately, it's the wrong one. Can we have the, the next one, please? This was supposed to be for one speaker that couldn't make it today, so we are sorry for, uh, for the little trouble, but I think we're gonna get it very fast. Very good. So, in your opinion, what, are, what is needed to bring digital solutions to market and to be adopted? We heard a little bit um, what the hubs should do or could do. This is simply a word cloud that you can create by yourself. Feel free to type in a word or maybe a short sentence, but mostly one word is okay. And while you do that, I will shortly introduce Oshoya Kutel. Oshoya, she will be joining us digitally, has a master's degree in European studies, and he, she joined NRDIO, which is the National Research Development and Innovation Office in Hungary in August 2020 as a Horizon Europe Officer in the Department of International Affairs. She has gained several years of experience in EU funding while working in Brussels. Today she cannot be here physically, but she will attend us digitally. And um, she's currently the Hungarian Horizon Europe National Contact Person um, and member of the Energy for the Energy and Cluster 5 for the city's mission. She's also representing NRDIO in several European partnerships, as for example, the CTP, Clean Energy Transition Partnership, the Driving Urban Transitions and Aeronet Smart Energy Systems. And she's also one of the co-chairs of this Aeronet Smart Energy Systems platform. And her hobby is pottery, I was told. So, Orsoya, are you with us? The floor is yours. Yes, hello everyone. I hope you can hear me. So thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction and uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, I'm very happy uh, to join you through uh, Digital Solutions. Um, and today, uh, indeed, I would like to, to speak mainly uh, as uh, one of the co-chairs of the GPP SDS uh, Smart Energy Systems uh, Network. Um, I would have the same technical questions, whether you can share the slides or should I? I think we can share the slides. Give us a second. Thank you. Yes, here I am. 
So, um, first of all, just very briefly, uh, I would like you to introduce to the GPP SCS uh, platform because this is a giant programming platform. Uh, which is a network of uh, national and regional funding programs, uh, the managers and owners of these uh, financial support programs. And uh, we've been active uh, for many years. Uh, me, myself, I joined uh, the GPPSCS uh, two years ago, and um, I will quickly give you an overview of the different initiatives we have and of course those ones or focusing on those ones which are um, uh, in the field of uh, digitalization. So what we do is uh, that we fund uh, RDDs or uh, research development and innovation projects uh, from uh, different angles. So from research uh, through uh, demonstration uh, to, to, to market adoption, uh, adoption. And um, we have different focus initiatives, one of which is uh, NRDigit. So practically through this focus initiative of uh, GPP SES, we try to encourage uh, um, and to bring uh, digital solutions uh, to the clean energy transition. Um, as I said, we are funding different projects, um, both in research and development, as well as uh, piloting and demonstration. And we had a call two years ago in 2020, where 21 uh, transnational projects were awarded for funding. And uh, these projects have participants uh, from uh, 17 uh, different regions or countries. It involves a total of uh, almost 150 partners. And um, 77 participants from business entities so it's not only research and uh, university uh, research institutions and universities but all the different stakeholders uh, what we very much encourage uh, in our uh, program is an integrated interdisciplinary, uh, the so-called three-layer research model. Because what we realize is uh, that we need not only uh, to ask ourselves the question, what is the technology which we need for this uh, twin transition, but we also need to ask uh, how we can organize the new business models, how we can um, arrange uh, the market solutions, uh, the legislation and so on and so on. And as a third layer, we also need to take into consideration the, the how we can support best the different stakeholders and how a massive uh, market adoption can be realized. So in my next slide, uh, I highlighted uh, different um, initiatives, what we have beyond the funding, because uh, our programming platform is not only focusing on uh, funding opportunities and calls for proposals, but we also have this uh, knowledge network. We have a network um, of uh, many different stakeholders, as I mentioned, and uh, some of the main initiatives I've listed in this slide. So we have a validation network of living labs and test beds, which is practically to support our funded projects through connecting them with uh, stakeholders who are interested in testing and validating these uh, developed solutions. We also have a network of uh, digital pl platform providers where we bring uh, ICT solutions to the already funded projects. So this is very important because it was mentioned before uh, today in our session already that we need to really take into consideration how we can connect the already existing projects, how we can um, bridge different initiatives because we have so many different initiatives and different uh, funding programs uh, throughout the, the European uh, ecosystem that we want to encourage our stakeholders to, to make best use of it and foster um, implementation of these project ideas even beyond uh, the, the time span of, of these projects that we fund under the GPPSCS program. So that is also related uh, to the project chain program, which is a quite new initiative uh, that we launched. And uh, there we practically focus on how we can connect uh, different funding programs, for example, whether it comes from European, national or regional funding programs, how we can um, initiate and uh, uh, foster 
the cooperation of different stakeholders and project owners and program managers across countries. So to build a transnational network practically uh, where, we, where we can uh, not only um, help uh, the, the participants and the project owners to connect uh, with each other, but to also build synergies and to, to make sure that uh, these projects um, will eventually uh, result in uh, long-term benefits and solutions uh, that can be used in um, in the future for for uh, for reaching our goals uh, when it comes to um, uh, the clean energy transition. Um, we have different activities and tools how we can support our network partners. So in my next slide, I listed uh, the different types of, of actions that we do together uh, in our uh, programming platform. So as I already mentioned, uh, we have this so-called living labs and testbed where we give the support uh, to validate and test the project results which were developed uh, in the funded projects. We also want to encourage our uh, stakeholders to, to make use of the ICT solutions uh, provided in the, the digital platform providers uh, initiative. Um, furthermore, we also uh, hope um, that um, our stakeholders and the project owners can benefit uh, from the market expertise uh, which are provided uh, by other uh, type of stakeholders by different intermediaries um, as you can see and uh, we also want to um, focus on the, the long time uh, benefits of, of these developed projects, how to participate in co-creation of solutions which, uh, which go beyond uh, these couple of years of, of project development. Um, what is also a quite big emphasis uh, in our program is to ensure that uh, our stakeholders uh, can uh, expand their network and build connections. So we have a lot of matchmaking activities for upcoming calls and I will mention that later as well that uh, in the GPPSCS uh, program we launched uh, regular calls um, in the different uh, focus initi initiatives but um, now in the future uh, we will be um, continuing our activities under the CTP so the clean energy transition part partnership and uh, the first call of, of this partnership just came out uh, last week so we already launched a matchmaking um, platform for, for this call as well and I think it's very important because uh, if I can give a bit of insight of Hungarian uh, point of view I hear that a lot from our uh, national stakeholders that uh, for them often uh, the, the biggest challenge is, is to find the right partner so I think it's, it's something that uh, our stakeholders not only the Hungarian uh, but uh, all around Europe um, and beyond uh, appreciate a lot. And uh, then uh, the last point on, on this slide, even though this is uh, just a taste of all our activities, but uh, what we also encourage is uh, to giving the opportunity to our stakeholders to pitch their project. This is again uh, in relation to the matchmaking activities. It's very important that uh, both the results of the funded projects and the solutions developed can be um, showcase to future uh, partners and um, uh, need owners, uh, if you like. So just very quickly, um, I have one slide which shows uh, the interest or the participation of our uh, stakeholders in these uh, different activities, but I don't want to, to take too much uh, of your time uh, on this. Uh, you can check it uh, later because uh, you will all receive uh, my slides. But maybe what is the more important is a bit of a um, future perspective. So in my uh, next slide, I show two important points how we want to continue our activities and uh, as you can see I already mentioned the CTP initiative so the clean energy transition partnership which is practically the continuation of many uh, Ethernets in the field of, of clean energy transition. We launched a new call this year and um, we, we've started matchmaking um, platform for that and also we will have the first uh, first uh, deadline of, of uh, the preparatory phase in, in November. So I encourage uh, all the interested parties to, to check out the link on uh, my slide. And then uh, what is also very exciting that just in October, so in less than a month, we have the annual uh, programming uh, conference 
where we have many different topics uh, that tackle uh, similar topics uh, to, to, to the issues we are discussing today. So as you can see, uh, we will uh, have different sessions focusing on uh, partnering for clean energy uh, or clean technology business uh, clusters. Uh, we also want to discuss uh, how digital platform providers can support the project without reinventing the wheel, so without duplicating a project. And then, of course, we focus on many different funding and financing perspectives as well. Um, so uh, that was my contribution for today. And uh, I thank you again for having me in this um, panel. And I, I hope to, to discuss further in the, in the next minutes. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Azulia. Very insightful presentation. So we heard that uh, one of our speakers, in fact, is coming. So I hope uh, we can first show the results of our poll that we had done before, Azulia. Maybe we can take a sneak peek. Yes, there we are. Um, so we will also give you all this um, later on if you're interested in the answers themselves. I was expecting a word cloud, but now we have a lot of um, details here written as sentences and i think we might be able to address that later in our discussion and before we speak about the next speaker that's going to be also joining us digitally we would like to ask you another question as you know so someone already answered but feel free to join so how many common communication protocols do you think exist in heating ventilation and air conditioning so more or less how many of these protocols can you find at home if you, for example, want to install a smart home system or anything that is maybe a little bit smarter than just plug and play? And um, feel free to not be biased, number one. And number two, uh, give us some insights what you think. Uh, we have already some answers. Yes, very good. And I'm pretty sure that our next speaker, Gefrid, is going to give us some insights. So let me introduce the next speaker that's going to be on the stage. It's Gefrid Sebrat. He's owner of Energy Umwelt Consulting in German. He has a PhD in mechanical engineering and has completed postgraduate studies on technological environmental protection at university in Graz. And after working at, on, at a power plant for some years, he joined the Austrian Mobility Research for 11 years, a national and EU research project. And since 2008, he's been acquiring and conducting many different research projects. He has been also a part-time lecturer for mechanical engineering and modeling and simulation at the University of Applied Sciences in Styria. This is in Austria. And he's currently leading two Aeronet projects. Dear Gefried, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me and introducing me. It's such an honor to be able to present the project. Uh, basically, I'm talking about one of the projects I'm leading now. This is the EPC for SES project. And if you could show the first slide, please, or or make make it possible oh thank you very much uh, this is the basic idea is in some of the member states based of the on the epbd there is some legislation mandating the use of xml files for the energy performance certification and those files are uploaded to databases and the idea behind the project was now to use the file to build digital twins so we are now investigating four different pilots using model predictive control on the basis of this information which is residing in the XML you see at the left side. And this digital twin is then uh, able to modulate the set temperature of the room or the charging of the domestic hot water tank. So this is generally the aim of the project we're focusing on demand control options, also including market partners or the di distribution system operators and also district heating. 
because we are targeting all the feedback of the data from the prognosis at the buildings to those network operators. Next slide, please. Um, during the project, we found out that there are several use cases for the data we can see uh, when looking at these XML files. We identified six different use cases, and in the project, we're concentrating on use case five and use case six, building energy management and central load forecasting. The sixth use case is when using the information from the buildings for null predictive control of central network components, like for example, the solar thermal charging of a buffer tank. These findings we, we can now uh, tell you are some general findings. We have found that in those XML exchange formats, there was some lacking information to build a digital twin. But this is not a real big problem. The bigger problem was that the authorities declined to make use of that information. But this is changing now. We will have at least individual access from the building owners to their data, and we can expect that aggregated data will be available in the next years, if there is some pol pol policy pressure, for example, in directives. We do have uh, set up a questionnaire for the use cases, but what is more important is that we found out that digitalization in those district heating networks is not such that we can start with such services right from now. There is some problems because the network thermostats are necessary and they should be connected to an MPC controller, energy management system of the building. And here come, I come to the question, we have 12 different protocols, maybe there are more in the buildings. So this energy management system should connect to different bus system in the building to be able to alter the a set temperature for the room. We have found that the domestic hot water model predictive control, but also the set temperature control for the room temperature uh, have uh, been uh, delivering good results for the room temperature, approximately 10% is to be expected. But we can also apply model predictive control for the buffer tank in a district heating network increasing the utilization rate if there is uh, a large amount of solar aperture and a smaller uh, buffer tank volume than MPC is right there. Also here the problem is we have no uplink in those networks and we need of course to optimize the CO2 footprint. We need some CO2 signals from the grid. I found out that in Denmark the grid operator uh, has some information, a forecast for the next hours, but in the other European countries, I did not identify such a service where the amount of CO2 per kilowatt hour is prognosed for the next hours. So thank you very much. This is the last slide, and I'm very open to discuss uh, the project and the findings. Thank you so much. Thank you too, Gerfried. So maybe we can get back to our polling to see what people thought about the question that you in fact gave us. So how many protocols can you find in a household? It's, you think it's 20 or more, so it's very complicated. Um, Gerfried, do you want to refer to that? I think it was 12, but please correct yeah, me yeah. if I'm wrong. Posit, posit, this is, is a based on an article, uh, and uh, depending on the region, there might be some, some sub-variants, and uh, I also think there might be more than 12, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, okay, thank you very much. So, as we can see, it's still fairly complicated to implement 
a system even at home if you want to just put things together. So our next poll question will be, according to a study in 2019, what do you think? Which continent has the biggest microgrid capacities installed? So while you are giving answers, maybe we can already switch to, the, to our new speaker is Patrick Biard, Head of International Affairs at Aura EE. He has a master's degree in physics and was prior to his current assignment at various senior international management positions in the energy sector uh, in Asia and Europe and North America. Uh, and now Patrick is in charge of the national affairs at Amtriad. Um, I don't speak French, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Auvergne Ron <clears throat> Alp, Energy Environment and Deputy Secretary General of Pre Premier European Network, all also called Federine or Federine. I tried my best. Perfect. Um, <laughs> he coordinates a few EU funded projects and manages also relations between EU um, organizations <clears throat> in charge of sustainable en energy and environment protection programs. Um, he has more than 20 year experience as a senior expert in smart energy metering, energy networks, and renewable energies. And his hobby, I was told, is architecture. And the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot and good afternoon from my side. Uh, I'm here today as a coordinator of this uh, EU funded project called Alpgrids, focusing on uh, microgrids in the Alps. Uh, it's an Alpine space uh, project. Uh, the project is actually not complete, but I'd like to share with you some uh, insights from this project based on uh, experimentation that were carried out in five uh, Alpine countries. Uh, so maybe I can use show the slide. If you can, yes, wonderful. Not this one, we'll take this one. Okay. <laughs> yes, so our main focus within uh, AppGrids uh, was to increase the uptake of renewables in the Alps uh, through microgrid solutions. And uh, the solutions that in this case are aimed at supporting uh, the development of collective energy actions within uh, local energy communities and citizen-led uh, initiatives. And what we mean by collective uh, energy actions are actually those uh, implemented by a group of prosumers uh, in the production, storage, or consumption of energy, such as, for instance, the recent scheme on collective uh, self-consumption. And one of our biggest challenge within AppGrids was really to develop a common understanding about microgrids among local players, uh, for instance, community owners, municipalities, but also to work with policymakers uh, to help advance the policy framework, especially for energy communities. And I'll share with you in a minute a couple of uh, examples. Uh, maybe a few words about microgrids for those of you who are not familiar with it and what they are. Uh, so their definition has uh, evolved over time, depending on the application, but there is now quite a consensus on what uh, they are. Uh, in short, microgrids can be defined as a small-scale energy system, electricity, but could be also other types of energy, grouping several prosumers on a given territory. Often could be a village, a district, a campus, or industrial uh, area. And they can operate off-grid or connected to the main grid or both when traditional connection is maintained as a, as a backup, for instance. So within our grids, our focus was mainly on network connected sites, uh, especially targeting energy communities. So what are the market drivers uh, and ma driving forces for uh, uh, microgrids in the Alps? Uh, definitely, the market for microgrids is uh, quite fast developing in the US and still, uh, I would say, emerging in, in, the, in, in Europe. But we see some significant opportunities, especially one driver, of course, is the growing electricity demand and need for a resilient energy system. Another key driver for microgrid is linked to uh, the advent of uh, energy communities and citizen-led initiatives, uh, really wanting to increase their energy autonomy and in some cases uh, reaching self-sufficiency. Corporate sustainability goals, 
as well could be a strong driver. And the good news is that in Europe, we have some proven microgrid technologies available and the global um, key market players uh, uh, located in, in, in Europe. And finally, uh, we see uh, a fast evolving uh, policy environment for, uh, especially for energy communities, uh, bringing more opportunities for microgrids. And I'll, uh, I'll talk about this in a minute. Uh, definitely, there are still some roadblocks uh, to, to work on, uh, especially, as I said, to develop this common understanding about these new uh, innovative um, technologies uh, but also work on some regulation uh, aspects and technical standards. So in practice, uh, let me tell you briefly what was done and some key results insight from the project. So we um, basically we implemented eight pilot sites in five countries. Uh, various configurations and applications were tested, allowing us to uh, assess various technical but also legal organizational challenges. A few of them are listed here, such as uh, collective self-consumption, also in public buildings and in communities. Uh, in some cases, we had direct, direct line system to supply uh, energy to local consumers, uh, but we, we also tested uh, multi-vector uh, microgrid solution and storage solution. So the second pillar of our action was really on policy policies and working with policymakers at various levels, uh, local level, regional, macro-regional, uh, and also national level. And the idea was really to, um, being, uh, to work with them on the transposition into national laws of the EU directives, for instance, on, on energy communities, and also work with uh, policymakers at local level to make sure the policy gaps were, were addressed, for instance, in uh, integrating supportive measures into their local energy plans, such as the, the CECAPs. So this was done basically through uh, some key actions. We created a sounding board of policymakers with more than 70, uh, 70 uh, people attending, and uh, they helped us and guided us in our work. And we also developed some policy recommendations that are available on our website and were discussed with, uh, with them uh, at various levels. The third uh, element was really in terms of scaling up the actions through replication and capitalization. And here this was done through a replication program involving uh, 13 organizations uh, outside the consortium. Uh, through bilateral exchanges with, with, with uh, pilot uh, owners. And uh, we also organized a summer school for postgraduate students uh, to help them apply this knowledge into their daily work, coming daily work. So several guidebooks and capacity building uh, documents are available on, on the website. And just to walk you through a couple of our findings, um, Definitely, we think microgrids can significantly help optimize um, local energy generation, a powerful from the grid and local consumption. Definitely, they can help improve the resilience of the energy system. They can support multiple and various um, advanced um, applications and collective energy actions from the, the, uh, led by citizen or citizen groups. Uh, I mentioned collective self-consumption, but we also had uh, projects on energy efficiency and also shared e-mobility supported by the, these microgrids. Uh, one key uh, finding from these discussions we had with policymakers was really the importance to involve DSOs and energy regulators early enough in the process especially since the roles and responsibilities of the community owners and DSOs are not always uh, clear in the, I would say, in the national legislative frameworks. So this is important to have this dialogue uh, going on. Uh, we think the move to microgrid represents a, 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 a step change, not only in terms of technology, uh, but also in terms of mindset uh, for businesses and communities. And here, this is important to uh, support social innovation in this, in this process through the 
various hubs, platforms we mentioned earlier, uh, this is an important, uh, this was an important finding. And last but not least, I'd like to mention two policy gaps, which I think would need to be worked on uh, at national level in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, one is definitely around this uh, definition of roles and responsibilities uh, of microgrid operators and also some work on flexible network tariffs to really reflect on the use of the, of the network. And I think I'll close here. Uh, yes, uh, we think that the EU market uh, will offer nice opportunities for microgrids and uh, you have here some key, key elements. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and uh, look forward to your questions or comments. Thank you very much, Patrick. So let's look at our poll. Where do we stand? What do you think? Where can we find the most microgrids? Ah, okay. So we believe that we are number one. In fact, I was also a little bit surprised is North America. So um, I was also following a little bit this discussion on microgrids and there is a lot of learnings that we can take also from there. So maybe we should also look a little bit more outside sometimes and uh, see what we can get from there. So maybe something learned for today. Let's start our next uh, poll before I introduce the next speaker to you and our last speaker for today. What do you think are the major challenges for DSOs in the future? So we heard a few things also Patrick was mentioning in this regard. So feel free to uh, put your input in here, um, especially the people also here who have the opportunity to scan the QR code or the people online, please feel free. And um, while you do that, I would like to introduce to you Gintare Skorupskatje. I hope I pronounced it correctly. A strategic planning lead at Energios Skismo Operators, or, or short ESO. Sorry if this was wrong. In any case, it's a Lithuania D DSO, if I understood correctly. And you are doing the strategic uh, planning, so to say. And um, her responsibility is leading this uh, formation of a company's long-term strategy and especially to analyze uh, future energy trends and see how DSO can react to that, um, their business model, operating model, or, or in general, the services that could be developed. And uh, currently, her focus is to ensure that the ESO, so her company, from the solid digital transformation strategy, so a little bit more insightful uh, inside the company, so to say, when it comes to this transition. And uh, her hobby is hiking, as is mine. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, if we could go to the slides. Uh, first of all, I would like to start with giving maybe just short few facts about uh, ESO. And uh, just to know that it is um, part of uh, a, larger company, a larger company called Dignitas Group. Uh, we are state controlled and we are the only uh, DSO within the country uh, which is when you will look across uh, Europe, um, you can find so many different settings and uh, maybe not that many that uh, are operating as uh, standalone DSO. But we operate together both in electricity and gas and also are pro providing guaranteed uh, electricity and gas uh, supply for those that are in need. Maybe you can jump to the second uh, slide. Yeah, here you can also see some figures and depending uh, what type of DSO you are and where you are, this might look big or small. Uh, we have uh, 1.8 million customers um, and distribute uh, electricity all across, across Lithuania. Um, gas is, uh, let's say, the, the smaller sister of the two, and it is actually one of the more diminishing parts, I guess, given the, the future trends. Um, we don't know what, 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 how it will look like, but uh, it's not, let's say, the, the bigger focus. If we go to the next slide, um, we can talk about, so what does it mean to be a DSO today? And definitely it is um, juggling a lot of things, so to say. From one part, uh, our main responsibility still is to secure a reliable uh, and stable grid 
And that in the context of, of climate change now is becoming harder and harder with uh, even more storms that are unpredictable and, and create uh, havoc on the grid. On the other side, we have a huge responsibility uh, for, for both Europe and Fene as well uh, to integrate as much renewable energy sources as, as we can and, and as much as we need in order to ensure um, that we have uh, energy security within, within our border, borders. And that, of course, creates uh, challenges on, on its own, uh, giving the, the volatile peaks. But we see digitalization as one of the key tools, basically, that we need to adopt in our daily lives that could uh, help us go through this transition. Uh, and that means that we need to change the way we operate, our day-to-day -day activities, uh, how we look at our grid investments and defer, let's say, grid enhancement, uh, more focusing towards on uh, grid automation that actually is, um, let's say, better use of money uh, when we want to integrate a, a large amount of uh, renewable energy. And how do we focus on uh, digital innovation hubs? Uh, where do you see our role? Um, if we go to the next slide, I try to pinpoint a few key uh, points that, that we, for, from our DSO perspective, see as, as very important ones. And most, let's say, most important for us uh, is to have the ability to build a well-functioning um, energy ecosystem. In Lithuania, for example, we are both going through the liberalization pro uh, process um, and also rolling out our smart metering program, which means that the market currently is experiencing a very rapid change of con even consumer mindset when they look up into energy. And we feel that digital innovation hubs can really play a role here by um, uh, increasing the awareness of what opportunities are there as well as uh, ensuring that we are able to connect the right stakeholders together uh, and share that knowledge across the region. Secondly, as mentioned, digitalization for this zone is going to be even more important than it is today. Um, historically, let's say we have not been as digital compared to TSOs, but that with changing, uh, but that is quite changing a lot in, in regards to adopting renewable uh, energy sources, which are changing the energy flows. And we need to have more uh, digital uh, solutions and more automation uh, within our grid. That to say also means that uh, our consumers are also able to benefit from more digital solutions of better understanding um, their energy consumption. And here promoting uh, talent and promoting uh, available businesses that can come to locally to perform um, better, uh, better, let's say, products, better solutions is both beneficial for the consumer, but also for us as, as DSO, because sometimes it's easier to, let's say, find innovation elsewhere than to innovate within yourself. Last but not least, um, data access and security um, is becoming more and more important topic especially when we talk about utilization, uh, then it's becoming even more so important to ensure that we have enough trust from our customers that the data that we share is going to be shared in the right way, is going to reach the necessary people only with the necessary protocols installed. And that, of course, means that we want to focus on not building, uh, let's say, local protocols but uh, want to look also for what the region is doing in order to ensure that we have the necessary interoperability later on, uh, because that is also part of um, EU goals, let's say, to build uh, European data space. So we do not want to, um, let's say, create obstacles uh, in the meantime. So this is something that uh, we, from a DSO perspective, see as, uh, as let's say, the, our challenges and where we see digital innovation hubs really coming in and, and, and helping us along the way. Um, thank you for listening. Maybe we also can see what do you think about what are the DSO challenges and maybe we can also tweak some of the pinpoints. Great transition. Thank you, Gintare. So let's look shortly at our poll questions. Uh, what you have gathered as data. 
about what the challenges might be. Okay, we have, I have a few things. And uh, I'm just looking at the time. We are a little bit behind, but I will at least try to address one or two questions that you have um, told us. I also have the tablet here checking how many questions you have asked. There could be a little bit more, but nevertheless, um, let's try to activate one of them and see if we can show them in our Q&A session. Let's see. Maybe it will show, maybe not. <laughs> will we have the question, maybe? I clicked yes, but now it disappeared. <laughs> I should have just read it, probably. That was the smarter thing to do. Okay, while you're maybe waiting, I have maybe one question that I'll, uh, I'll like to address. So we heard that um, the innovation hubs will help small and medium-sized enterprises to um, holster or maybe push their digitalization process um, and scale it maybe. So my question was how can um, these hubs interact between the states? So if you have uh, a hub in Germany and a hub in Austria and a hub, you know, can they also interact? And if they interact, how will they interact or do we know this? So maybe a question to you, Julia or Eve. Just to repeat one more time the question, so how can the innovation hubs, when they're already settled on a national level, how can they interact with each other? Because as far as I understand, but please correct me if I'm wrong, um, the hubs should be a local thing, so you can go to your local hub and talk with them about stuff that regards digitalization. How about the interaction between the hubs themselves internationally on a European level, let's say? Yes, I think. Yeah. Indeed, it's more like uh, a, a question for Yves and our colleagues from Connect and is about how the apps are also set up and what is the network that is built, so. Yes, so so the, in order to have the network, uh, what we have done is we have also uh, made a different type of supports so that the hubs would know also the competence of each other. So, uh, for example, a catalog of the competence that the, that the hubs can fill. Uh, and then we have also a, set up an action which is called the Digital Transformation Accelerator, uh, which is really there to animate the network, to make sure that there will be an exchange of good practices among, among the hubs. So that is, they, they will not be left alone to create this network, but we make sure that the, the network is actually delivered uh, and they will help also the hub with collaborative platforms. So the, the things that you will have to think that uh, could be done in common will actually be done in common by this action. So we also do not have, uh, uh, let's say 136 uh, collaborative platforms. There is one which is delivered for, for all of them so that they, they know each, o uh, each, each other and they can really work together. Thank you. Any other comments from our panel? No, maybe one more question before we close the session. Um, I'll try to reiterate what was written in our Q&A. Um, it was said that a lot of data will be gathered uh, due to the process of digitalizing everything. And the question was, is there on a European level some type of initiative to gather all this data and make it more accessible? So maybe also someone who is maybe not a hub or maybe also doesn't want to become a hub, but is just interested in the topic, can they also access this information freely without any, let's say, obstacles? I hope I rephrased that question more or less correctly. Sorry if I didn't. Yes, I, I can also answer the, this one. Um, well, freely, it, re it remains to be seen. Uh, is it free as, as in freedom or is it free as a free beer? Um, so that is a, 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 at no cost. Uh, actually, we have two different uh, legs on which we, we are working. One leg is the deployment of data spaces. So data spaces is an infrastructure, is a set of rules of governance um, to put together so that 
uh, when you are you are you are then able to share data and to have others reusing your data, but in a controlled way. So the, the type of permission and security would be would then be put by the the person who is supplying the the data. And here uh, again, this technology deployment we are financing this through um, the, the Digital Europe program. So the, the same program as we finance the digital innovation hubs. Uh, and there are a number of data spaces. Uh, there is a data space uh, for a the um, for a health observation. There is a data space uh, for energy. So you, you see, we have a number of those. Now it's not because they are sectoral development uh, in each one of them that they will have to be non-interoperable. On the contrary. We really try to make sure that they would interoperate one with the other. A data space for agriculture might want to have access to a data space on weather data. So you see, there are lots of uh, interest of, of sharing of sharing different data. Now, the question was, is it for free? Well, that would depend uh, in the sense that there might be some data that would be uh, for free. It depends on who supply the data. And then there, there might be other data that would be there provided at the cost. So there are, this, this is the part. The second leg is a regulatory part, which is more looking into which kind of rules do we want to have in order to share data. And there has been recently a data act, which is actually going a bit deeper. We had a data strategy, we had a data governance act. So just uh, by the way, adopted, and now we have Data Act, which specify a bit which kind of rules that we want to have uh, for the data intermediaries, for for the for the supplier, uh, whether it is as a cost or not. So the, these are the, these are the part. So this is really the the regulatory aspect where we we are going a bit uh, deeper, because indeed, as one thing is is we moving away in terms of energy, and and probably the future is going through a full electrification. The same thing in digital, we are all converging on data. Everything that we are in the end doing is uh, looking at data, how we get the value out of, out of the data. So voila, that's the, the things that we are, we are currently working on. Uh, and there are indeed a, a strong sectorial interest in the, uh, in the energy sector. Thank you very much. So I would like to close the session uh, as the maybe last sentence for our session. I hope that the digital innovation hubs will provide all the, all the mentioned things and hoster and help especially small and mid-sized companies to scale or to find new opportunities which, with digitalization. And uh, with that, I wish you a great sustainability week. Enjoy your time and great evening. Thank you very much.